On May 28, 1944, the USS Lagarto slid sideways into the Manitowoc River, one of 28 submarines built by the Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company. Each of them launched sideways because of the narrowness of the waterway. It was like the 4th of July. Everybody in Manitowoc turned out, all the, all the people from the shipyard and I think all their families. There was a, quite a crowd. This wave went roaring across the river and it was just way over their heads. It knocked them back. There were people scrabbling around, all soaking wet. Trials on Lake Michigan soon followed to make sure everything worked properly, including Legardo's 86-man crew. Then it was down the Mississippi to New Orleans, through the Panama Canal, and off to Pearl Harbor. Legardo's commander was Frank D. Lotta, a veteran of nine war patrols and recipient of the Navy Cross. Lotta, also a motorcycle enthusiast, kept a secret hidden aboard the sub. I've often wondered how he managed to keep secret his Harley. At every port, he'd take it apart, break it all down so it would fit down through the hatch and hide it someplace that, that the Navy never knew about. And uh, then they'd get someplace, like r and port, they'd take it out in the dock and put it back together and off he'd go. He was very friendly, got along wonderfully with his crew. He was one of my mentors because of he was a guy that would really tell me how it was. But in May 1945, in the Gulf of Thailand, Ben Jarvis would see his mentor and the Legarto for the last time. Jarvis's command, the USS Bea, had just outrun a hail of gunfire from a heavily armed Japanese convoy. Lata responded to Bea's call, and the two sub-commanders spoke over the open water. It was a windless night, very flat sea, and we didn't have to use a megaphone at all. He just said, well, you've been shot up and shook up, and I think I better take the next try. The Legarto was never heard from again. Hey. Members of the Wisconsin chapter of the U.S. submarine veterans of World War II researched Japanese war records and contacted Jamie McLeod, a British wreck diver in Thailand, and asked him to look for the missing sub. McLeod and his crew aboard their boat, the MV Trident, had seen Thai fishermen's logbooks, which indicated where their nets were snagging on something big near Legardo's last reported position. Two years ago, more than 100 miles from land, McLeod found an American submarine on his first attempt. First thing I saw was the very, very front of the bow. And then I didn't quite reach the conning tower because I was so excited I wanted to get the signal up to the guys quickly uh, to come and have a look. It's a big ocean, there's a lot of wrecks. The coordinates could be from anywhere. Um, luck was on our side that day, very much so. The Navy conducted its own dive on the sub last year and found enough identifying details to claim it as the Legarto and place this plaque near the submarine's aft capstan. But questions about how the Legarto went down remained. In March 2007, the Wisconsin Maritime Museum sponsored an expedition to the Gulf of Thailand. John Chatterton and Richie Kohler, profiled in the bestseller Shadow Divers and hosts of History Channel's Deep Sea Detectives, conducted four dives on the Legarto looking for answers to how it sank. Joining Chatterton and Kohler, Evan Kovacs, who not only wears all the specialized rebreather dive gear, but also maneuvers the bulky watertight housing for his high-definition video camera. I mean, look at the size of this thing. It's like pushing a smaller fridge through the water. Descending the guideline, the first and faintest parts of the sub Chatterton and Kohler saw were the periscope shears, housings that still contain the periscopes despite more than 60 years in tropical salt water. The submarine is sitting upright on a flat, sandy plain in 225 feet of water, encrusted with corals, sea fans, and oysters. Its stern is tightly wrapped in the Thai fishermen's nets, but underneath the tangle, the rudder is visible, hard to port, and all of the dive planes are turned downward indicating a steep dive. Not just diving and turning, but you're talking a, a radical dive, a radical turn. Yeah. This was clearly a, a very extreme, evasive maneuver. What Legardo could not evade appears to have been a single depth charge. There's one large hole torn into the port side, estimated to be at least eight feet wide and at least twice as high near the officer's quarters and forward torpedo room but there's no indication that the innermost pressure hull that held the crew was punctured. 
anyone in that compartment next to where the, the weapon detonated would, would have probably been knocked unconscious. I am sure that the people in the forward torpedo room were all bleeding through the mouth from their lungs, nose, and ears. The blast pushed the pressure hull inward roughly three feet. We've seen other uh, submarine wrecks that have uh, suffered a pounding and we've seen dents in the steel, but this is way beyond that. If this is the cylinder of the hull, the side is actually bent in exactly like my fingers are showing you. The Japanese got lucky, a perfectly placed depth charge. But, uh, you know, the things that we don't know, how did water make its way into the submarine? That question remains unanswered, but the starboard bow reveals a clue to Legato's final moments. A torpedo tube remains open. Kohler put his still camera inside and found it empty. The wreck tells us that she fired a torpedo, and then before she could get the chance to get down to safe depth or close the door, something happened. Howard Ortega. At public ceremonies like one held in May of 2006, the Navy said the empty torpedo tube indicated that the Legardo's crew was in the midst of a battle. Inside, the middle torpedo tube was open and the torpedo inside was missing. So USS Legardo apparently went down fighting. In addition, at a length of 311 feet, the Legardo was longer than the depth of the waters in which she was maneuvering. That meant even if there was time, there was no room to dive deeper. It gave the enemy greater odds of a fatal blast to Legardo not to mention shockwaves that could rebound off the bottom. You have a, a lot of things going against you in a, a shallow body of water like the Gulf of Thailand, and really there, there's, there's no place you can run to. All of this water, just not deep enough, you couldn't dive if a surface guy was on top of you, uh, because you just you couldn't maneuver. You didn't have anything underneath you. That doesn't seem like much of a sacrifice to come this far and to take a boat out 150 miles out of sea and bounce around a lot in light of the sacrifice they made. John Kenny, a grandson of Signalman First Class William Mabin, observed the dives on behalf of families of Legardo's crewmen. I I'm satisfied that they're doing everything possible to be as respectful as they can uh, and still do a great job. I think the people who at Manitowoc should be very proud of this. These sailors would have really liked to know that when they're gone and then rediscovered that people care and that they'd want, they'd want to know their story. And that the fact that no one is tampering with any of their remains, some people will take items from a dive as mementos, none of that is being done. The torpedo tube, the dive planes, the damage, all leave a frozen image of Legardo's final moments. It is a snapshot filled with dramatic action. I believe Legardo went down swinging. I, I, I don't think that uh, she, she uh, went quietly into that good night. I think she took a bunch of swings on her way out. But if Legardo was in such shallow water, why didn't any of her crew try to escape? They could have made an escape at that depth without any trouble. But all of the hatches were found closed, including one nearly 200 feet from the blast. Did crewmen choose to stay with the doomed sub rather than risk certain enemy capture? Preservation, you'd want to save your life. Anything that you can get to hang on to. Uh, frankly, I would rather be picked up by Japanese than be uh, Drown. I received a telegram, a little man on a bicycle, just like you see in all the old movies, came to the door and gave me a telegram that said that Harold was missing in action. When it's missing in action and they really don't know what happened to it, there's no trace of it, there's always this hope that perhaps they'll find him on an island, maybe they're in a prisoner of war camp, uh, maybe they'll come home. We may never know why no one tried to escape. But we do know that Legardo became a tomb for 86 crewmen whose sacrifice we honor and whose remains the Navy has stipulated shall not be disturbed.